so this year, um, I had an edited collection come out. It's called Rereading Appalachia, Literacy Place and Cultural Resistance. Um, I edited this book with a colleague of mine named Kim Dunauer, um, who's a professor at the University of North Dakota. And really what we're trying to do in the book, and this is where this idea of resistance comes in, is so, so many of the narratives that we have, not only even culturally, but I would even argue in the field of literacy studies itself, um, these narratives are about Appalachians as being illiterate or deficiently literate, um, which is someone who identifies as Appalachian is really offensive. <laughs> so one of the things that we really wanted to do with this collection was, well, to tell our story and the stories of the people that we love, the stories of the people of Appalachia, um, and show that there are many, these are, you know, these are people who are highly literate, um, granted in many different ways, but we specifically focused on print literacy in this collection because that is the area in which Appalachians have historically been uh, stereotyped as being deficient. But I am currently working on a new project, uh, which would be um, a book of my own, or you know what, in the business we would call single single author uh, monograph, or in other words, a book written only by me, um, with all my own work. And this book, uh, my research here focuses on, um, and again, it gets at this idea of disrupting stereotypes. Um, a lot of my work comes back to that. Um, but my research here focuses on Appalachians who are highly educated, which I'm defining as at least a master's degree, and then how their beliefs about literacy and the ways that they use literacy have evolved throughout their education as well as into their career um, for the people who, at the time that I interviewed them, were working. But yeah, it's been a really really good thing so I'm still I'm still in the process of um, you know, I have a few more interviews to finish up there and then I'll be in the process of analyzing those interviews um, you know, looking for um, what we would call emergent themes and patterns um, and coding um, which is essentially where you look for not only emergent themes and patterns but you see that okay so this you know, this person has talked about this, or, and here's something that um, I have seen through reading the transcripts, when my participants tend to switch from talking in the first person to talking in the third person. And when they want to distance themselves from what they're saying, they flip to, I think, instead of just you know, making a kind of a definitive statement about um, whatever you know, my question to them might have entailed. It's, well, I think, da, 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 da. Um, and so when I talk about coding, it's not only looking for um, you know, the, the, con the content, so to speak, of what they're saying, but also like what linguistically is going on here. So I had the opportunity this summer uh, to go to the Dartmouth Summer Seminar on Writing Research, which was really exciting um, for people like me who have PhDs in composition and rhetoric and literacy. Uh, Dartmouth is a special place because um, there was something that was known as the 1966 Dartmouth Conference, which if you're a composition history junkie, you know that that's really where our field first emerged as a field. It was basically a meeting of English teachers, um, both American and British, who came together to talk about essentially, well, what are the problems that we're seeing in teaching writing to our students? And out of those conversations, the discipline that we know today as composition and rhetoric um, was born. And so you know, I remember our maybe second day at Dartmouth, 
uh, they gave us you know, a tour of the campus and it's a beautiful campus. And we were in the library and they took us in the part of the library where the 1966 Dartmouth conference was held. And it's just one of those moments of, I'm standing where my discipline was born. It was just for someone like me who was kind of a history junkie, um, it was really exciting. So it was, it was a great opportunity with, in terms of that. Um, but also, I think there were around 18 of us from not only all over the country, but also the world. Um, we had uh, composition scholars from Korea, England, Sweden, Germany, um, and we were all there to work on our research. So the project that I talked about earlier um, about how highly educated Appalachians literacy changes and evolves, you know, that is what I, I had two weeks there that I could really work very intensely on that project, um, time to um, really look at those transcripts and start thinking about Okay, how do I how do I code these? I learned new ways to code, um, and I was able to get feedback on my work from some of the leading scholars in the discipline as well, um, which is so valuable because you know, once once you're out of grad school, you don't have kind of a ready-made mechanism for getting feedback on your work in progress. You know, you do once you have the article written and you send it off, but you really kind of have to work for it. Um, you have to form a writing group or do some other things to get feedback on your work as it's in progress. So to get that type of feedback from scholars I really respect on my work when it was still very much at a conceptual stage and in the analysis stage was just huge. So um, yeah, so it was probably, I would say it was probably the most rewarding professional experience I've had since I finished grad school. Um, it was really, really wonderful.